Well, good afternoon. Welcome back to Bite Size Corrosion for our final two sessions where we are discussing the ECDA process as it's described in NACE SP0502. Now, over the past few sessions, we have discovered that ECDA or External Corrosion Direct Assessment is a continuous improvement process. It's not a once off thing. Through successive ECDA applications, the pipeline operator or the asset owner is able to identify and address locations where corrosion activity is occurring or where it has occurred, or in fact, where it may occur. And in fact, that is one of the big advantages of ECDA is that it does help us to identify those areas where defects could form in the future, and not just those places where we know corrosion is happening. So we've looked over the past couple of sessions that by taking the physical characteristics of our pipeline and its environment and its operating history into account, that was the pre-assessment stage, taking that into account in conjunction with data from multiple field surveys that was in our indirect assessment stage, and then directly looking at our pipe surface, so that's obviously the direct assessment stage, we can combine all this information and evaluate it, and then provide a comprehensive integrity rating with respect, obviously, to corrosion. Now, today, we're really delighted that we can welcome back Francis Bradfield to help us as we chat through the fourth and final stage of the ECDA process, which is called post-assessment. So that's just a reminder of the NACE standard, and you can purchase that at the NACE website or amwp.org. Now, some of the main objectives of this post-assessment stage, let's start looking at those. Francis, what are some of the things that we're wanting to do in this post-assessment stage? I think, basically, we are assessing absolutely everything we've done all the way from the pre-assessment. I think it's really important that every time we do an ECDA, we're always looking backwards until this last, very, very last section where we start to look forwards at what's happening. So in our first steps of our post-assessment, we need to look back at what we have done before. We need to look back at our pre-assessment and remind ourselves of what we've done before. We need to then look at our indirect assessment and remind ourselves of those results. And we look back at our direct assessment and see, is that what we expected from our direct assessment, what we had in our indirect assessment and our pre-assessment? And based on all of that information, we can then look towards the future and see how we're going to use all this information and this whole process going forward. I think that's very helpful is just to keep our eye on what we have done and see where we can go. Now, as we've noticed before, in each stage of the process, NACE has compiled a flow chart, which can be quite helpful. Let's have a quick look at this. So as we see here, and the reason why I wanted to bring up the direct assessment one is at the end of our direct assessment, we expect to be ready immediately to do our post assessment. But what you can see here is the flowchart as you follow it going down, you end up at required number of excavations met, yes or no. And if it's yes, you go straight to post assessment. And in your post assessment, the first thing that you're supposed to be doing is reevaluating the life of the pipe. So I actually think that if you follow this, it all makes a lot of sense until this last part. Um, as I said, you need to start looking backwards with what you're doing. And the first thing we need to do here is, do we have all of our information? And now that we have all of our information, what are we going to do with it? So as it says here, remaining life calculation. The remaining life calculation, I believe, we can only do once we've got all of the information going down, including our mitigation measures, and is this what we expected, yes or no? If we get into a hole that we expected to have really good protection and we have active corrosion, our remaining life calculation in that location would be poor. But if we find that we can mitigate that issue, whatever it is, when we find it, our remaining life calculation could be much better. So I don't think that this necessarily follows. So if we go through more to do with what the flowchart says as to do. Is there right. a course analysis? Now, I think that this is more important at the beginning stages than doing the remaining life calculation. Mm -hmm. The root cause analysis takes what we had before, what we measured outside and what we saw with our own eyes. And it says, 
look at this issue that we found this defect, this low potential, why is this where it is? Because if we know why, we can know how to mitigate it or if mitigation is possible, and then we can decide on the remaining life. I think that's very valid, Fran. I think it's important that we use this opportunity at the root cause analysis to see if we can find what could have been the cause. And it's not always necessarily just a sort of general corrosion consideration. There may well be something very specific in that location. And as you rightly say, it affords us the opportunity to look and see if there is a mitigation method that we can implement. And perhaps even in the remediation, we might find ourselves mitigating some of the cause of the problem. Exactly. I think one of the main things I can think of is if we were unable to do a SIPS, but we knew from a DCVG that we had a defect, but we expected from the local test post monitoring on either sides, we have a defect in the middle, we have good potentials in this test post, good potentials in this test post, we assume this one to be properly protected. But when we get there, we see that there's active corrosion. And when we measure the potential at that location of the excavation, we see that it is not protected. It's very possible that we have a current drain somewhere between those two test posts. And that's something that we wouldn't know without this ECDA. So that's like a great tick in the box for that. And perhaps we have a touching pipe or a power cable with old lead sheathing or something like that touching. That's actually happened before. <laughs> power cable with lead sheaths touching the pipe, not a great idea, but that's easily remedied by putting in some kind of isolation between those two or jacking the pipes apart or something similar to that. So the mitigation that you might expect before the dig up could be different when you see it with your own eyes. And I think it's important in the ECDA process to keep an open mind because I think the next point is the reprioritization and sometimes reclassification of what we anticipated finding. Did we find what we expected in your example? We found a defect where we actually did not expect one, but we did also determine that to mitigate that is easy. And although it has diminished the life of that portion of the pipe, it should not corrode at the same rate as it has corroded to date because of the identified cause. Exactly. So, I mean, another good idea of having to reprioritize an area would be somewhere where, say, in an urban environment where you did not expect there to be significant stray currents. But upon looking direct assessment and the indirect assessment stage, we suddenly found that there's a higher level of some unknown stray currents. Somebody light poles, for example, are earthing to the pipe or something else interesting is happening. You find all sorts of amazing things when you start digging. That would cause you to reprioritize a green area as we had in the previous little tables that we had before into an orange or even a red area, which would mean that we would need to follow up more often at the end of the ECDA process in order to make sure that we were still safe going forward. And just based on your discussion earlier, I think it's at this point here that we would actually then look at the remaining life calculations to determine how long do we think that this pipe will now last and then how frequently are we going to come back and have a look at the pipe? So theoretically, and I do use that word quite strongly, theoretically, if you have a fully protected pipeline, you should have zero measurable corrosion for an infinite lifespan, theoretically. Of course, we know that this is not necessarily going to be the case. But if we have a section of pipe or an entire pipeline that has had effective cathodic protection that we can prove for the entire life to date. It is not unthinkable that we could extend the lifetime by the full Same. design life. Again, you've got to be very careful with making sweeping statements like that. And that's where your reassessment interval will come in. If you expect to have perfect cathodic protection as you have had for the last 10 years, you will need to do a reassessment in I think five or 15, I can't quite remember the number, just to check that your assumptions are still valid. So I think the standard actually says that you reassess in one half of the expected remaining life. So if you expect the life to be 15 years, you would reassess after seven years. Right. I think it's also important to note there though that that's presuming everything you know about stays the same in as far as you can know about it. If they suddenly install another pipeline in the pipeline corridor, for example, 
or activates a new DC tramway running through the streets of Joburg, just like it was 1932, or whenever the last trams were going around Joburg, we would obviously need to reassess that risk and we would probably step up our indirect assessments, potential measuring SIP surveys, everything else we can do just to see what the effect of this new external factor is on our pipeline. That's a really good idea is that you don't have to do the entire process each time, but by putting in the indirect surveys, which are relatively speaking cost effective and easy to do, you can keep yourselves abreast with a lot of information about the status of the pipe. There's also an, a line item in the ECDA process, which refers to dealing with the effectiveness of the ECDA as a concept. And I think that's quite important that one mustn't leave that out. Was this process effective for our pipeline? And, and I think you've just hit the nail on the head for our pipeline. We know that this is an effective process overall it makes sense it's logical we've had a lot of things and i think you and neil will be discussing that next time on what you have seen in the past and how you have had the follow-ups going again and again but that's not necessarily the case for all pipelines if you have a for example very new brand new quarter two kilometers of pipeline going through the middle of nowhere between a dairy farmer and his water tanks chances of you needing to do a full-blown ECDA every time is incredibly low. And if you were to do that once, I think you'd find that there is no point in digging up the pipeline at all in that case. So what works for Vanessa's pipeline does not necessarily work for the old McDonald's pipeline. Indeed. And I think that that's something one shouldn't lose sight of. Just because the process exists doesn't mean it has to be used. But also because the process exists, it's a really good idea to consider the principles of the ECDA process when you are evaluating your pipeline and its life. And I think with infrastructure aging worldwide and the costs of of everything associated with maintaining infrastructure being so high, I think the concepts of the ECDA process are really worthwhile. Most definitely. And I think maybe sustainability is becoming the new buzzword and a bit of greenwashing. But I think that in my, well, actually, in my opinion, corrosion is one of the most sustainable engineering forms. We are trying to take an existing asset. We've spent all the energy. We've spent the money. We've spent the resources. We've spent the CO2. We've spent everything, time, engineering in making this asset. And what we do coming in later with corrosion assessment and cathodic protection and coatings is protecting that asset and trying to prolong life, or at least making it last the design life. Um, And not only is that attractive monetarily, but also environmentally, I think we are becoming more and more, well, it's it's been shoved down our throats and probably with good cause. We should be considering this going forward, not only for your wallet, but also for the world. I think this is also another aspect that forms part of the ECDA process this concept of feedback and continuous improvement, not only doing routine indirect assessments as it were, or surveys, but also just evaluating what worked, what didn't work, and how could we do it better. Perhaps verifying and confirming the effectiveness of our ECDA is also achieved by doing a, a random dig just to confirm that what we expected in that zone is in fact what we found. Yeah, I mean, maybe going forward, remembering that we try not to dig unless absolutely necessary. True. So that would be my hesitation on that. Of course, it would be great if we could dig up the whole pipeline and look at the whole thing and say, oh, you, it's all looking great. Sorry, lady, we'll put your house back together afterwards. But I think that feedback can definitely come in, especially when we are determining the successful nature of our mitigation or not. So if we have taken steps after our ECDA to mitigate a factor, cross-bonding, to another pipeline, bonding to a transformer rectifier unit, or falling current from a transformer rectifier into the train tracks, or however we decide to do it, depending on what, what's happening, burying deep earth electrodes for AC interference, that kind of thing. Depending on what we've taken, we should be undergoing a mini ECDA, probably until the direct assessment. So again, redoing our pre-assessment and our indirect assessment and having an iterative process of that after implementing a mitigation measure. So 
doing a lot of potential measurements and doing SIP surveys, maybe not a combined SIPs DCBG if we're doing it at relatively short intervals because we don't expect there to be new defects, but we can definitely see what the potential at those defects is. And we can see that, say, severity of the stray current on the pipeline. Francis, just looking at this flow chart, the one thing that I feel that's missing, although is implied, and which is really important, is record keeping. It's become my big bugbear, is it's all very well that we go out and take photographs and we take measurements. But if we don't find a way to store that information so that other people can use our findings, it's just a complete and utter waste of time. Completely. I think that's probably something that would benefit NACE to put in as an actual block between direct exam examination and our post assessment is to have full record keeping while everything's still clean in your mind. So when you've gone and you've taken 14 pictures of one defect, if you deal with that data on a relatively short scale, you remember which defect it was, why you took these photos, at what stage you took these photos. And you should be making sort of a mini report per dig at the very least, at least for the direct examination. That way, like I said, you know, so somebody doesn't have to come find you in the bar when you're retired and ask you, do you remember this dig? Chances are you're going to say, woof, I can't remember if it was this picture or that picture. You know, so record keeping is incredibly important. And I think we're lucky in that we have so many tools at our disposal now with the digital age to keep the whole survey together. Like I think I mentioned before, ArcGIS, so web-based geographical pin locating service that gives you either reports or data or pictures at one specific location. And that can be very useful. We've seen some major asset owners invest in that technology. And I think that's very helpful so that you do start to build up a single location with the history of, of your asset. I'm aware of one asset owner who every leak, every repair that they were called into damage, everything was pinned on their system. The difficulty came when the person capturing the data left and someone else took over and didn't really understand how that data had been captured. And then it was difficult to find. And that for me is one of the challenges with the digital age is that, and this shows my old fashioned gray hair perspective, but sometimes when it's all in a file and you can spread it all out over the table or the floor, you can see it all in one place rather than visualizing it digitally. Yeah, I think sort of on an aside, obviously related to ECDA, because here we're talking about mountains and mountains of historical data, as well as new data. But in general, as engineers, we really need, and, and operators and technicians and anybody, traceability and data quality, not just quantity, is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. If, like you say, you have an amazing graph of huge stray current interference, but you have no idea where it was from, that is as good as toilet paper to anybody else. If it's not tied directly with a location or a time or mm -hmm. a period mm -hmm. in, in history, it's not useful. If I have something, a horrible stray current graph that actually was from a time before we installed some mitigation measures, I'm going to have a freak out because I think, oh my word, it's not working. But when we look at the data, we see, okay, it was actually before, and this is the after, and we're very happy because it's what we assume. So even though we have um, a lot of ideas of being cold and calculated and methodical, I think a lot of engineers are a little bit chaotic in their record keeping, and it only works in their logic, in their brain. So we should try and think of us poor young engineers trying to remember what our old engineers were we're trying to understand what the old engineers were trying to get across to us and think about the next generation and how we can help them out. Maybe we need to think about coming up with a system, but I think that's way beyond what we're discussing today. So just heading back now to the ECDA process, I think that the post-assessment stage is often overlooked and I think is actually the most important of the stages. Because it's at this point that you can consolidate all your findings and determine how everything interrelates, a bit like a puzzle. You know, sometimes when you sit back and you look at it, you go, of course, we saw, for example, stray current interference at, at point A, and we picked up something unusual at point B. Maybe those are connected, the timestamp might work for you. 
and you can start really to tie all the ends together, which will then give you a better determination of your root cause and a better mechanism to come up with suitable mitigation. It's the most important, it's the most structured, and it helps you get the entire overall picture. If you don't do the post-assessment, all your previous works, especially the direct assessment, are in vain. So following through, even though it can be the most tedious, as you say, making doing a puzzle, and it could take ages and a lot of different people and input from different locations for you to come up with something useful. But if you do not apply the post-assessment correctly, you have wasted your money, especially in the direct examination mm -hmm. time. And I think there is place. I know we, we said remaining life shouldn't be done at the start, and I believe that's accurate. But I think it's very helpful to, to perform the remaining life calculations. And in this um, particular standard, there are a couple of recommendations on how to tackle that, because that can be quite daunting. But it's a good idea, especially if you've got some of these assets where there's some debate, should it be replaced? Should it not be replaced? And there is a section of the population, the engineering population who will say, well, it's exceeded its design life. It should be replaced when there's not necessarily sound basis for that. So having done the ECTA process, you might determine that actually your pipe is in superlative condition still, but one can calculate the remaining life and then have some confidence in saying, well, our estimates are that we've got another 15 years, yeah. but let's reassess in seven years for safety. And depending on the appetite for risk of the operator or your level of confidence on the data that you've received, especially in the pre-assessment phase or the life history of the pipeline, because as I said, you can't unzip the soil, look at the whole pipe and zip it back up again and leave it like that, you might be more or less inclined to make a bolder statement on the lifetime. So for example, if you can comfortably say 15 years, let's reassess in seven, your company or operator risk profile might say, Oof, we're not 100% comfortable with that. Should we split the difference maybe three and a half years or five years, which will add extra data into your feedback loop for the ECDA which should help you after that next ECDA that's maybe premature to perhaps extend it slightly so that you can calm everybody down a bit and calm yourself down and reassure everybody, you know. At the end of the day, as we discussed in the very first lecture of this series, it is all about risk and risk mitigation. And so there are always people with a healthier appetite for risk, but you just need to make sure that you can sleep at night and you've done your best basically. I think that's been very helpful, Fran. Thank you. And I think if, if nothing else that we've tried to talk about today is just how we can capture the whole thought process behind why we did what we did through, through the ECDA process. And again, capturing that information, helping to detail our thinking so that the next person who comes along will understand the thinking and they can make wise decisions in their ECDA as they go through it. So we really appreciate your time, Fran. It's been wonderful having you chat with us for these last few sessions. It's been great that the virtual media allows us to talk across different hemispheres. So thank you so much. Tomorrow, we're going to look at some examples where ECDA has been applied, where we've used the ECDA process and the principles and how in some instances, a pipeline which was earmarked for being completely replaced, was retained in service because of this process, and other instances where it was identified that sections of the pipeline did in fact need to be replaced, that they had exceeded their useful life. So that's where we headed in our next session. And as we close, I just want to thank everybody for joining us for lunch today. And I do hope that you'll join us tomorrow for this final bite-sized corrosion in our ECDA little mini-series.